Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thank you to the White House for bringing us all to this outstanding conference and bringing me back to the Reagan Building. Uh, thank you to President Biden, Ambassador Rice, the entire administration, Secretary Vilsack, for the extraordinary commitment to putting America right uh, at the top of the fight against hunger, against malnutrition, against chronic disease. And as you know, there's a lot to do, so we're gonna jump right into what I believe is the best panel at the conference. <laughs> uh, and uh, you'll see why in a moment, uh, because of our outstanding panelists. Uh, before we jump right in, I do wanna say uh, that, that the Rockefeller Foundation has had a chance to be part of this very conference 50 years ago, and we are thrilled to be back again uh, today. But increasing access to affordable, nutritious food is a challenge we are deeply committed to, and improving the quantity and quality of humanity's food is a critical part of that task. And we believe in starting with the science, and that's very much what this panel will be about. Today, as President Biden said so eloquently and emotionally, the science has connected the dots between diet and disease prevention and treatment. And as a result, we've seen uh, data that tells us, including from Tufts University, that a 30% subsidy for fruit and vegetable purchases via Medicare and Medicaid would prevent nearly 2 million cardiovascular disease events and more than 300,000 premature deaths from cardiovascular disease alone. It would also save our health system $40 billion in healthcare costs over the lifetime of just current enrollees. We can draw on this knowledge and this science and this emerging understanding to design and scale food is medicine programs. That's what this panel is about. And that's why I'm proud to announce that starting next year, the Rockefeller Foundation and the American Heart Association, represented by its dynamic leader, Nancy Brown, who's with us here today, along with our inaugural partner, Kroger, plans to mobilize $250 million to build a national food is medicine research initiative. Thank you. This initiative, thank you, this initiative is about more than a dollar figure, as you know. It's about a public-private partnership that makes these programs a reality for millions of Americans who need them. We're already on our way, thanks to our collective efforts and Nancy's leadership. We're in discussions with payers and delivery systems, including Kaiser Permanente's integrated system, companies like Apple, you might have heard of them, they make phones and other products, <laughs> <laughs> and with the largest provider of healthcare in the United States, the Veterans Health Administration. Uh, this is a good start, but unlocking the power of food as medicine will require all of us. It is in everyone's interest and it is everyone's responsibility, and that's why I'm excited about our dynamic and important panel today. Dr. Sachin Gain is the CEO of SCAN, a mission-driven organization dedicated to keeping seniors healthy and independent. Dr. Kofi Essel is a community pediatrician right here at the Children's National Health System in Washington, D.C. And Karen Pearl is the outstanding CEO of God's Love We Deliver, which responds to the urgent need for food and nutrition experienced by people who are too sick to shop or cook themselves. She is also the chair of the National Food is Medicine Coalition. So let's get started and jump right in. Karen, I'm gonna start with you. Okay. Uh, and I'm gonna start actually not on food as medicine. Okay. I <clears throat> enjoyed learning about uh, God's love, how it got started and what it represented. And I thought you might just share with us uh, that story because it speaks so much to something President Biden made reference to, but the basic dignity mm -hmm. of feeding every American. Sure. Thank you, and hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, God's Love We Deliver got started in 1985 in the height of the AIDS pandemic, when people were alone, isolated, really without food. They were wasting away, They're partly because of HIV and partly because they had no food in their homes. And God's Love, our founder at the time, uh, started to just bring food to people. And one day she left groceries on a counter and came back the next day to check on the same person. And the groceries were sitting on the counter. And she said, light bulb moment, people who are that sick, who basically can't get out of bed, don't need groceries. They need meals. And then started to 
uh, get volunteers involved to go and cook and then deliver meals to people's homes and spend some time with them. The very basic tenant being dignity and respect um, and love. Um, cute end to that story is one day she was literally walking down the street carrying bags of meals to the to number of people in the neighborhood. And a minister stopped her and said, what, Ganga, what are you doing? Her name was Ganga Stone. What are you doing? And she said, I'm delivering meals to people who are sick. And, she, and the minister said, you're not delivering meals. You're delivering love. Mm -hmm. And that's how we got our name, God's Love We Deliver. We're non-sectarian, even though that's a whole other story. Um, but uh, the tenet of, of two things, one is about love, is very, very important. The other side of that is that we believe food is love, food is medicine. And I just want to say that the importance of being getting started in the HIV world, um, as many, many of the Food is Medicine Coalition programs did, that's also their origin, is that from the very beginning we knew that, and Congress knew, by the way, that people could not benefit from HIV treatment without looking at the whole person, without looking at social determinants of health, without investing in food and nutrition. And so from day one, we were not only a meal program, but we were a nutrition program that ensured that the people who were getting our meals got the right meals for their particular medical circumstances. Well, thank you. And it's a great way to kick this off because uh, God's love and dignity is underlying what, what this is all about. Uh, Sachin, you run a healthcare plan. You run integrated delivery systems throughout the, uh, a big part of the country in California, Nevada, Arizona. Uh, and you are involved also in feeding your patients and your customers and your beneficiaries. At what scale do you do that? Why do you do that? Why is that important to you as the CEO of uh, such a big and important healthcare provider? Yeah, no, thanks so much. Um, SCAN, or you know, originally called the Senior Care Action Network, was founded in 1977 to try to address all the things that keep uh, older adults uh, healthy and independent. And over time, we migrated into uh, largely operating as a health plan, but maintaining that root, the root, maintaining that original perspective that we need to think beyond just medical care to keep people healthy and independent. Last year, we delivered over 500,000 meals to older adults uh, throughout our service areas. Um, recognizing that you can't really address someone's chronic diseases, you can't necessarily address their health needs uh, if you, they're hungry. Um, you know, you can give as many patients insulin or metformin, but if they're eating the wrong things or don't have access to meals, uh, they're going to end up in the hospital. A lot of what we believe is that we need to rethink how we think about our healthcare spending in this country and stop thinking about just paying for visits and paying for hospitalizations but start paying for the things that actually keep people healthy. And we believe meals are a really, really important part of that. Um, before I led SCAN, I led uh, CareMore, which was the care delivery division of, of Anthem, now called Elevance. Uh, and um, you know, we had grassroots activists, doctors, who set up food pantries in their Medicaid clinics, uh, recognizing that you know, they could take care of their patients uh, only so much if they didn't necessarily to provide them with the other nourishment that they needed. And so this is, this is a room full of people who recognize that you know, food and medicine go hand in hand. Um, I think you know, the opportunity for us as a society, um, you know, I'm looking at Matt Isles, uh, AHIP, the America's Health Insurance Plans, uh, for us to think differently about how we organize and structure the finance of healthcare in this country so that we aren't just paying for things when people get sick, but actually do the things we need to do to keep them well. Well, I'm so glad not just to hear you conclude that way, but also to share how you got there. Uh, we have a four plus trillion dollar healthcare system here, and I think one of the concrete goals of this panel is to move some real money within that system to food as medicine interventions. And Kofi, you're, you're a doctor. In my family, uh, my sister and I are both have medical degrees, but we have one real doctor. I don't practice, so I don't get credit. You're a real doctor. You're seeing patients every week uh, and kids. What do we need to know about the way uh, patients and your work informs this food as medicine movement? Uh, that's a great question. Um, when I think about, it sounds like we're really thinking about sort of the lived experiences of, of our families. Um, and I, I think that um, 
understanding the lived experience of our families, the stories that my family share with me, I'm honored to be able to have, to know, and it really informs the work I do each and every day in the community spaces that I'm in, uh, in my research, my advocacy work in general. When families come in to see us, uh, typically when I see them struggling with food insecurity, how do I know that? Well, what we do in our clinical space is we screen all of our families universally. We don't sort of isolate families based on anything we see, any biases that we may have, but it's a universal thing that we do. We use an easy to use screener. We determine if families are at risk for food insecurity or not. These families that are at risk for food insecurity, they tend to have certain traits uh, that we see over and over. It is sort of a, a trajectory that we see. The first things that our families tell us about is this concept of food anxiety, this constant perseveration, preoccupation with where one's next meal is going to come from. Uh, this, this idea sort of tends to decrease uh, what, what uh, Dr. Hilary Seligman talks about, decreasing one's cognitive bandwidth, the ability to shift and focus on many things because of that decreased cognitive bandwidth. After that decreased cognitive bandwidth, after that food anxiety occurs, we tend to see a decrease in the quality of food. That decrease in the quality of food we sometimes call a monotony of the diet. The diet becomes more uh, a decrease in desirability, a decrease in variety of foods. Families' foods begin to decrease because why? I'm not going to purchase foods that I may not eat. That stress, that anxiety, that toxic stress that builds up when my child doesn't eat that food, when I don't eat that food, is something I'm not willing to engage with. It's too hard for me to engage with. So I'm going to purchase the items that I know are going to last, that I know that my family is going to eat. After that decrease in quality of food, the next thing that happens is the quantity of food. We know our parents that we work with, my parents that I, I, I work alongside, they're loving parents. They'll do everything they can to protect their children from experiencing food insecurity. So what they do first is they buffer their children by eating less so that their children can eat more. The last step that we tend to see when the children are decreasing their food intake, we know that that is more of an extreme of food insecurity. But even though the children are experiencing that extreme all the way down there, that whole journey, we know that those children are feeling that palpable toxic stress of food insecurity with that increased anxiety and stress in the home. And th those are the things that my families often share with us. Well, I'm, I'm so grateful to have that uh, visceral understanding of what it feels like to be food insecure in America. Uh, one of the things, Karen, you've done with the, wearing your hat as the chair of the mm -hmm. Food is Medicine movement, coalition, enterprise, is, uh, is really looked at what are the best practices out there in terms of getting to the families Kofi just described, mm -hmm. getting them the kind of food packages that actually make a difference against their kind of chronic disease indicators. Mm -hmm. What are some of the best examples of success you've seen and what should we take from that in terms of how do we scale that up so fewer people are food insecure and more families have access to nutrition that prevents disease? I'll start by just somewhat clarifying that we work with uh, clients, your patients are clients, um, who um, are living with pretty severe chronic illness. So they don't just need good food, and we really appreciate that everybody should have good food. They really need food that is tailored for their particular circumstances. So best practices is that we, with our dietetic, with our registered dietetic, registered diet, Titian nutritionists, we are really clear about what those clinical guidelines should be. And we share them among all of the food as medicine providers. So everybody, while the meals may be different, because so much of what we're also focused on is closing the equity gap and really being thoughtful about creating food that people want to eat that, as we like to say, feels a little bit like what their mother would cook for them when they were sick when they were young. Um, so the food may be very different if the program is in California or if the program's in New York or Philadelphia or Boston, where some of my colleagues from, are from here today with me. Um, those, but, but the nutritional quality is the same. And then we talk about all sorts of best practices. And largely in the last couple of years, particularly, you know, we got our start in one pandemic, and here we are in another pandemic and really looking at some of the best practices that go to reaching the people who are so afraid and so alone and so isolated and doing that in a way that is really conscious of equity, not just in the food, but in all the different pieces of our program. Because we know that for many of the people who we all serve, we are the only face that they will see that week sometimes. 
And so making sure that our practices meet the nutritional needs of clients so they get the right meals, the healthy meals, tailored meals that are delicious because we eat with our eyes, and beautiful, we eat with our eyes before we actually taste um, so that they will want to eat, but also making sure that they're culturally relevant and, re and sensitive and that we're doing our best outreach in the communities that are most at risk, <coughs> BIPOC communities, rural communities, um, the low-income communities, the places that really don't have access not only to medically tailored meals, but to any of the real food as medicine interventions. Well, I'm, I'm so glad to hear you raise the need to target high-risk communities. And Kofi, you're dedicating your career to serving uh, those communities, and it's, it's so important. Sachin, when you uh, provide 500,000 meals to your beneficiaries, uh, are you focused on targeting those that are higher risk? How do you mm -hmm. know how to do that? And uh, I'm struck by a goal we'd like to get to is we want every health plan to provide, pay for, and study the impact right. of providing such meals to their beneficiaries. How, how do you think we ought to get there? Well, I think, you know, to answer your first question, um, you know, we focus on people who are particularly vulnerable. So if someone is coming out of the hospital and they have a poorly managed chronic disease, our care managers will identify those folks and will trigger the delivery of up to 30 days of meals for those uh, individuals. Um, we also have a benefit that provides up to 81 meals or a month of meals for someone who's going through an exacerbation of a chronic disease that needs to be better managed because we all know that if you're an untreated diabetic or hypertensive, you know, we can give you more and more medicine, but if you don't necessarily have the right foods in your home, um, you're not gonna necessarily get better. Um, I think, you know, to your, answer your second question, um, we have an opportunity to build an innovation ecosystem around food. I think that is the opportunity that mm -hmm. is before us. Um, you have people in the room like Kevin Kumler from Verda, you've got people like Lauren Driscoll. These are people who are looking at food as an opportunity to transform the care experience, to take, again, dollars that we're otherwise spending on avoidable emergency room visits and actually provide the things that people actually need to be healthy and to stay healthy. Um, so I, if, you know, president didn't ask me, but if the president were to ask me um, what he should do is he should unle unleash an innovation ecosystem. Um, we need more, uh, I think, data, frankly, about who's facing in food insecurity. Uh, and so you need you know, people like Anish Chopra who are trying to build interoperability across health systems so that people who are part of the social safety net actually have data to understand what kinds of issues people are facing instead of having to meet them every time and put them through a potentially embarrassing situation talking about their needs. Um, one of the things I learned as a, as a physician is you can't necessarily solve a problem if you aren't asking about it. And if you can't ask about it, if you have nothing to offer someone. And so I think we have to build a toolkit for clinicians to actually be able to solve the problems of people who are facing food insecurity and hunger. And um, you know, at that point, you then could unleash the entire you know, world of clinicians who really wanna do more for patients because you're giving them a prescription pad that offers them you know, something to give to people. But today we have hungry people and you've got a healthcare system that doesn't know how to necessarily address those people's needs. I think that's the opportunity that is ahead of all of us. So Kofi, why don't you speak to that? What, what, what do you need as a clinician to be able to really provide the kind of food-based interventions to your uh, patients and their families that, that would meet the needs you see in the community? And do you, do you feel you have that? Do you feel like you know what you need to tell them to do or you can draw in prescriptions of food services that take the payment responsibility off the family and place them on, the, on somebody else? So uh, I don't have it, uh, <laughs> but um, I think there are some things that are, are, are looming, the things that we're working on. Uh, I know the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Food Research and Action Center put together a, a dynamic toolkit. Uh, this AAP FRAC toolkit is a toolkit designed for pediatric providers uh, around the country to identify and effectively screen for food insecurity intervene meaningfully by connecting families to federal nutrition programs, community resources as needed and beneficial, and also to advocate, stepping outside those four walls of our medical setting and using our voices to make change at a higher level. And I think that's really important. Can I ask you a question about that? 
when you tell your patients to change their diets, do they listen to you? Um, I don't, I, okay. Or uh, maybe I asked the question in the wrong yes. way, uh, so you so correct the question. But I, I don't tell my patients to change their diets uh, initially. So I, I think it, th this is a great question, and I, I, I've been thinking of this a few different ways. One, um, I'm working alongside my patient. We're working together as a team versus me having this ideal where they need to be. We are going to walk alongside this journey together with each other without me coming in as a quote unquote, as one of my mentors used to say, a medical deity, an MD, right? Like I'm working with them. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, if it's okay, I want to highlight uh, some of the work that we're doing to really get at this uh, space. Um, when I think about our role as clinicians, I think it's great. We're doing good things, but we can't do all of this. and We're not supposed to do all this. We never could do all of this. So recognizing the role of our community partners are critically important in this work. Our community-based organizations that we work with are part of healthcare, and we need to recognize that and we need to appreciate that in healthcare as well. So the way I kind of think about this and the way our institutions have been working at this is thinking about this through a clinical community lens, right? Creating these collaborative approaches. At our institution at Children's National, we began to screen, again, universally for food insecurity when we recognized what it did, how it affected our patients and families. After doing that work and after seeing that, we said, hey, how do we create better systems around us? So we teamed together with the YMCA of Metropolitan Washington, uh, the American Heart Association, and created a community clinical collaborative to do this work more effectively. In doing this, we created systems to take our families, connecting them with meaningful programs in the community, created produce prescription programs in the city, working with local farmers, delivering fresh produce to our families, and training our providers how to do this work in a non-stigmatizing fashion, and also bringing in the lived experiences of our families to help to educate our families as well. And we've seen meaningful change with that, and we think in order to do this work well, it has to be combinations and partnerships, not just the clinicians, and I think that's an important piece. That's outstanding, thank you. And I think, well, let's, let's give them a round of applause for that. I think, uh, I'll tell you, I've seen data from those types of partnerships that basically show when done well, they work. And the most powerful data I've seen uh, is actually against the endpoint of hemoglobin A1C levels in pre-diabetic high-risk patients. Uh, and um, it's stunningly important uh, research information that I hope every healthcare provider is making themselves aware of so they can bake it into reimbursement. And Karen, that's what I want to talk to you about, which is reimbursement. Yes. Uh, we spend a lot of money in American healthcare. Mm -hmm. uh, we do not spend a lot of American healthcare dollars on reimbursing uh, for these types of interventions mm -hmm. and the process that Coakley just described in a really mm -hmm. powerful way. What do we need to do to get payers to pay for this? I'm really glad you asked me that because I was trying to be polite and not interrupt and say, wait, I want to address that. <laughs> so the biggest, I mean, Kofi, what you're doing is amazing and I love it and I hear from my colleague here in DC how great the work is that you're doing. And there's a patchwork of this great, of the programs like yours and some in New York and some in lots of other um, states in the country but very few, and there's lots of data, data about reduced rates of reliance on emergency departments, on rehospitalizations and hospitalizations, on cost savings. There's tons of data. There's lots of patchwork of these programs, but what's missing is the actual policy that makes reimbursement for food as medicine for medically tailored meals, which is what I'm most comfortable talking about or most knowledgeable talking about, a, re, a fully reimbursable benefit. Because if that happens, thank you. If that happens, we then can build into your innovation, the new medical system, starting in medical school, all the way through from referral uh, to screening, referral, treatment, coding, I don't want to get too policy wonky here, data, and ultimately reimbursement, the whole system really needs to get aligned with believing in food as medicine, supporting it, teaching clinicians how to connect to, to systems, and ultimately then reimbursing providers. And when we get there, we will have a much healthier population that is either helped to prevent illness with other food as medicine interventions or with medically tailored meals treating chronic illness and really reducing the rates 
and reducing the cost and improving the outcomes mm -hmm. and improving quality of life. It's like everybody wins. So I, I agree entirely. And I think, uh, Sachin, I want to come to you and ask basically the same question. What, what do you think folks in your uh, type of role need mm -hmm. in order to be able to actually secure reimbursement for the types of interventions Kofi were, was describing. Yeah, so I, I mean, uh, these meals are reimbursed right now for progressive health plans that cover them. Right. And so um, our health plan has done it for 45 years. Um, there's a number of others who've done it for less time, but we welcome them under the tent. <laughs> um, but you know, ultimately, I think the opportunity. And do you do you see them? Are they coming under the tent? Like, do you see they more are coming plans under the tent. coming? I mean, there's a this is an industry where there's a lot of copying, and so when you do something new, others kind of quickly follow, um, and so I think there is a lot of an increasing recognition. I think one of the cautionary notes I would strike, though, is making sure that we acknowledge that we don't do a great job delivering healthcare. We do not do a great job delivering healthcare. So now to put this added burden of delivering mm. foods. <clears throat> when we don't do a great job delivering healthcare um, is gonna require us to think more, think differently about creative partnerships with organizations like those that are represented here um, and make sure that we're thinking about a more networked approach as opposed to continuing to layer on more obligations onto you know, all parts of the ecosystem. As far as reimbursement goes, you know, I think the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation have an opportunity to introduce some new pilots. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's opportunities um, to uh, use existing authorities around the diabetes prevention program uh, to get more meals to patients. There are a lot of different vehicles, but I think we have to you know, start to think about the connective tissue. I also think we have to have a broader national conversation about thinking beyond just health and thinking about interagency collaboration around these types of, of initiatives. When I worked in government, um, you know, putting a man on the moon and <laughs> you know, changing health policies that required different you know, the coordination across different agencies was like putting a man on the moon. I mean, that is, um, and we have to kind of, I think, recognize that for some of these types of issues um, that cross agriculture and cross and commerce and healthcare that w and technology, we need to be able to, you know, work more seamlessly um, and and create that collaboration infrastructure. And that's where I think we need more leadership. And I'm so pleased to be to see that kind of leadership coming from the very top of our, of our government today. Well, I'm excited to hear you say that because right here in the room we have important decision makers from all of those institutions across the federal government and the White House, and, mm -hmm. and this is a, a clear priority. I will highlight that the American Heart Association effort to build a global research platform is designed to drive reimbursement over time to these interventions mm -hmm. based on having the data that shows what works, what doesn't work, in which settings, how do you tailor it, and how do you make it a big part of the provision of healthcare. And Kofi, I wonder, you, your description of the way you do your work is really inspiring, mm -hmm. I think, to all of us in this room. I'm gonna ask you to step back, be a little bit critical, don't worry, you'll, you'll be protected, I promise. <laughs> when you look at your colleagues who are mm. clinicians, yeah. do they all share your point of view about, hey, food, nutrition, serving the whole family in the meeting folks where they are and doing it with such respect and such dignity uh, is a part of their job? Is that something of you course. think is built into American <laughs> primary <course>. care provision? 100% <laughs> of them. Um, so, so I think it's a, it's a great point. And, and I think it, it, it begs the question what's going on. When you look at sort of our clinical practice guidelines dealing with diet-related chronic diseases across the country, what do you see as a core tenet? Food and nutrition is a core tenet. Lifestyle medicine is a core tenet. But we never really give food and nutrition the chance it deserves. Why? Well, our, our training has been woefully insufficient for far too long, right? We've seen these, this, we've seen the data. The, the data, and I see some hands out there of some people in this space. We've seen the data. We, we, the majority of medical schools don't reach even the minimum number of, of recommended hours to train around food and nutrition. A third of these schools don't even reach half of that number. So what ends up happening? Uh, very, very well-informed, um, meaning, well-meaning rather, clinicians are trying to do the right thing, but oftentimes very stigmatizing towards their patients, not understanding the power of food as in medicine, not understanding the role of nutrition and health, stigmatizing body sizes, not recognizing how food affects body sizes, stigmatizing and, and giving rigid approaches to how they address the health of their patients, uh, using what works for them, right? And then saying, you should do this too. 
Again, rigid approach is not culturally conscious, and these things are not effective. At our institution, what we're doing is culinary medicine. Uh, it's one of the ways that we teach around food and nutrition. It's a, it's a tool that we use at George Washington University. Culinary medicine is basically bringing together the art of food and cooking with the science of nutrition and medicine. We bring these things together. We have a very multidisciplinary team, a chef instructor, a dietitian. Our executive director is Dr. Tim Harlan, who's a really big innovator in this space. And we really allow the classroom to be the kitchen for the students. Our medical students get into the kitchen. They learn about these skills that helps their own health and their own lives. And then they learn strategies through a, cultural, through a lens of cultural humility to apply that into their patients. Right? And that's so important in this work. And I think we're doing that, we're moving in that direction. It's just taking some time, but we're getting there. Karen, same question, but apply the, instead of thinking about clinicians as the agent of interaction mm -hmm. with, uh, with families and communities, it's, it's the God's love community. It's, it's mm -hmm. community service organizations. Do you feel there's an ethic and an understanding and a set of tools that enable those who do provide those social services uh, NGO or government to be effective and thoughtful the way Kofi is describing around how they interact on nutrition? Well, I think within, within God's Love We Deliver or any of the Food is Medicine Coalition programs, that community is very solid. The, the, you know, we're all, you know, everything we do is through the lens of nutrition right, with the RDN support. Um, and our chefs and the RDNs work on all the meals, and then we're all volunteer supported to a very, very big extent. And so the volunteers are there because they care and they want, they know that what they're chopping in the kitchen today is going to be in somebody's home tomorrow or the day after. And that's very meaningful because they know they're making a real difference mm -hmm. to somebody who's very sick. So in that regard, yes, but when I take a step out a little bit uh, in working with all of the healthcare partners that we work with, which are hospitals, health plans, and providers, it's not as rosy of a picture, I would say, in part because not everybody is like these two very wonderful enlightened physicians next to me who really appreciate food as medicine but also the structures aren't there. It's not always reimbursable. I happen to come from New York State, which is a pretty progressive state, so there are a lot of opportunities for contracting and for pilots, and, but a pilot here and a pilot there is not the same as a fully reimbursable um, benefit, and I just wanna be really clear that that's where we have to get to, mm -hmm. right? But where we are now, I'm going to clap every time you say fully reimbursable yeah. benefit. Please do. Just and as I, a I'll matter just, of that practice. will keep me saying it. That's why we're the best panel here. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Sachin, but but I, I want to caution us. I mean, I think we need a, a you know, f uh, for lack of creating uh, more jargon, like a precision food initiative. Um, uh, I'm a vegetarian, lifelong vegetarian, and I've spent my entire life going to steakhouses when I go to dinners and with other people. And I think we have to kind of acknowledge the fact that. Um, that not everybody eats the same things. People come from different yes. cultural backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And um, when I first started at Caremore, um, I actually wanted to taste the food that we sent to people. Oh, yeah. And we were sending people really bad food, <laughs> um, like m things you would never want your worst enemy to eat or your dog to eat. Um, and so I think that there's a quality movement that needs yes. to actually enter into this. And, um, and it needs to be really focused, not just on making sure the meals are nutritious, but they're also edible and they're also culturally competent. Um, Couldn't I agree think, more. Yep. And yeah. I hope you never need the services of a Food is Medicine Coalition partner, sure. but I promise that's what you'll get, including vegetarian. That's great. That's great. But let, let me ask, but I want to follow up because 500,000 meals across, or to 500,000 beneficiaries is a fairly big number, right? Do you feel you're able to oversee the provision of those meals, those services, in a way that meets the standard you just described of quality. We have to partner with others. We, we have to partner with others because we're not experts in food, yeah. right? We have to partner with organizations like yours mm -hmm. um, locally that are able to deliver. But in your judgment, are those are those provided in a way that meets the standard you just described? I think they're 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 good, but I think they could be better. They could be a lot I mean, better. Candidly, yeah. they could be yeah. better. Um, and, um, you know, we're looking at this you know, from the perspective of affordability as well, and being able to provide, you know, food to 500,000 people and you know 500,000 meals at scale, 
And so the question just becomes, you know, how do we do that in a quality way? Um, and how do we, you know, start to leverage modern tools and technology, you know, um, and, uh, you know, ways of actually delivering food that, you know, the rest of us kind of take advantage of uh, through Uber Eats or whatever other, you know, vehicles, you know, you like, you like to access, um, to be able to give people more of the kinds of things that they want to eat mm -hmm. that are healthy, that are delivered on time, warm, um, that's all really important. I think that gets, you know, forgotten. So I would say we're on in the third inning of really a So reimbursement inning. and quality. Absolutely. Absolutely. And a lot of cultural sensitivity. Um, mm -hmm. Kofi, just a final word from you before we wrap since Karen and such and we're able to share those concepts. Uh, and then I'll boil it down to one word. You, it doesn't have to be one word from you. I'm just saying, okay. what, what should we leave here with? Yes, this is a tough one. To right? make this stick. Um, I think the, the biggest thing that I'm gathering that I, I think we should leave here with is recognizing the role of hunger and cultural sensitivity in this work that we're doing. We cannot do this work unless we recognize those roles in this nutrition and health. If not, we're gonna worsen inequities. It's important to incorporate that health equity and make sure we have the lived experiences of families at the table, yeah. it's critical. Excellent, lived experience is what I'll take away from that. You've done such a great job of projecting that through this discussion. Let me thank uh, the White House for inviting us, the, our panelists for sharing those insights, and most of all, all of you for being mm -hmm. with us here and online. You do have the power to make this a major part of how we serve American families and children in those families, and we hope very much to work with you to come out of here, take action, and live up to the standard that President Biden laid out for us this morning about making sure we serve every American with the basic dignity of health and nutrition. Thank you Thank very you. much.